you, Vicki. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm looking forward to hear his word, <laughs> even though my wife's rolling her eyes. Uh, we'd like to welcome Pastor. We'd like to welcome you back. You were missed, and we can't wait to hear some of the things that, that you've gone through. I know it wasn't easy, but we're thankful for your life and all that you do. So um, I'd like to ask my wife if she's come and share the word. I know I told her, I said, the Lord, she has the word hidden in her heart. So the, whole, the Holy Spirit, as, she, as he works through her, it's just getting it from here to here. That's all. So God bless. Except when this happens. carrying stuff tonight. I have no idea why. Ignore me. I need to um, thank you, Lord God, for this night. And Father, I ask, Lord, your word I know is already anointed, Father God. I just pray that you will anoint my lips and my mind, that I will speak your word, that your word will come forth and touch and move our hearts, God, and accomplish what you desire in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. I thank Vicki for that. Did you pick those songs tonight? Thank you. I know I know that you seek God. I know that. I want to thank the Lord. We were singing in his presence. And where else could we go? Okay, but in his presence. You sang about the cleft of the rock, being in the cleft of the rock. That's where I belong, in his presence. Jesus made a way for come, us to come into his presence. And I just thank God for that. So tonight I'm going to begin in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Actually, you can start with chapter 19, and uh, I might just have to tell you the scripture when I see it, because I didn't write it down. Okay, in Exodus chapter 20, around verses 19, we see that Moses, it says, And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let, let not God speak with us, lest we die. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shall say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver, neither shall you make unto me gods of gold. This is not where I want to be. Forgive me. I, uh, I wanted to be in 19 and I was in 20. Where I wanted to go was when Moses went up to the mountain and the Lord was speaking to him and the Lord told him to go down to the people because God wanted to speak to the people from, and he told Moses to tell the people to prepare themselves for three days, to prepare their hearts, to come to the bottom of the mountain to meet with God but not to touch the mountain, not to touch the bottom of the mountain, but to come to where he will meet with them. And the people actually went through the three days of preparing their hearts. But when it came time to meet with God, the thunder and the lightning and the awesomeness of God, the manifestation of his presence, 
they couldn't do it. They were afraid. And they told Moses, no, you talk to God for us. We're afraid. I said, Lord, that's the same today. When the presence of God comes into this house, people have, might have, you know, they might come and they're all clean and they're all dressed right and they're all ready, you know, for church. And we've come and we've entered in and we've worshipped him. But when the word, the presence fills this place and the altars open, the people, and, you know, I don't know anybody or judge anybody. <laughs> I'm saying when the presence of God comes, the people are afraid because the rituals that we have done to prepare ourselves are on the outside. But yet, our God already knows. He's already seen it. He wants you to come, and he wants to, in his presence, expose those things, take them out. But we have to be willing to come. We cannot be, we must reverence his presence, but we cannot be afraid to enter into his presence. If you will open your heart and enter into his presence, he will show you, he already knows, he'll show you what needs to happen, and he will help you remove it. Later on in this chapter, Moses said unto the Lord, the people cannot come up. Uh, let me move on. Let's see. Um, in chapter 20, Moses delivers the, um, the commandments. And after that is when Moses, the people were afraid. And, and Moses and said, you know, you speak with God. Let us not speak with God. We will die. There's a portion of scripture in 2018. I'm sorry, that's where the thunderings and the lightnings came and people were gripped with fear. But later on in 2020, that's where I'm going. <laughs> in 2020, Um, maybe not. I apologize. In 2020, Moses, who had just spent time with God, And he told the people, Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is, not, is come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. God's plan is not, he doesn't want to kill them. He wants to be closer to them. He wants to prove them. He wants, like I said, he wants their whole heart. He wants to bring them closer to him. The 22 through 24 talks about making an altar of the earth. Thou shalt, um, after the, I'm sorry, after the um, Ten Commandments, it talks about uh, God telling them, an altar of the earth thou shalt make unto me, and shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. Come into today's world. Come into today's picture, Church of God. When you make your offerings, and you offer yourself unto him, and he accepts you, which he has done through Jesus Christ. It says, I, where I record my name, 
we have been given his name. We are called by his name. Jesus says his name on us. I will come unto thee. I will bless thee. We are the children of God. and We have been born again by Jesus Christ and acceptable unto God. Further along, there's a caution there in verse 25. And it says, And if, and if, thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shall thou go up by the steps of mine unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. So God says to come, but he says to come his way. Bring your sacrifice to him his way. We have our own ways. We need to come in obedience. We have our own ways. If we come in obedience, we'll be with blessing. If we come with our own ways, full of our fleshly ways, um, pride, selfishness, stubbornness, that road we know leads to destruction. In chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, and I know I'm jumping around a little bit tonight, Moses is exhorting his people again, and he uses the words, Hear, O Israel. Why does he say that? He says that because God wants to tell them something. He's, in the New Testament, it says, Let him who has ears, let him hear. We need to hear what God has to say to us. We need our ears open. It says, speak in your ears this day that you may learn. And that's Deuteronomy chapter 7. the statutes and the judgments which I speak in your ears that day that you may learn. So one, we may learn them, one, we may keep them, and one, we may do them. We need to have ears to hear what the Lord is speaking to us through his word and through his prophets. How many of us have heard thousands of sermons before t between Sundays and Wednesdays, special services, not to mention women meeting and conferences? How many of us have heard thousands of sermons. Pastor Bob has asked the question many times, do you take notes? Do you look at them later? How many of us sit and reflect on the word we've, we have received, whether it's later on Sunday or later in the week? Or if it's even, even sometime later, I've, I've found notes that I've taken and I'll go back and I'll be like, oh Lord, thank you for that word again. It's fresh. The word that God has for us is to have ears to hear and to, to come into his presence. He wants to meet with you. Moses instructed, um, instructed the people of Israel to hear God's instruct us to have ears to hear and have a willing and obedient heart. He wants us to learn his will and his ways to keep his will in his ways, and to do his will in his ways. In chapter 6, verse uh, 6, that's where I was trying to find it before. These words I command thee, this day shall be in your heart. This, he wants the word in our heart. Moses goes on in chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. He instructs the people of Israel that God is faithful. They need to teach their children what God has done, what God wants to do. Can I read that? Um, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12. Yes. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently 
unto thy children, and shall talk of them when sitting, sitting in thine house, and when walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of the, thy house, and on the gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee unto the land which he swears unto the father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou did not build. And the houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olives which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. Then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee out forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. There you have it. There you have it. That's the full message of that passage. Jesus said, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> when, when Moses spoke to the people, he said, I command thee this day, these shall be in your heart. You need the word in your heart. And you need to teach your children the word. And you need to talk about the word. You need to talk the word of God. Linda says it all the time. We used to meet at her house, and somehow we'd start talking about the passages of God's word, and we'd be learning, and we'd be sharing, and we'd be growing, even amongst friends. But your children, and I know people say, I don't, you know, if I talk about God, people are going to walk away. My kids are going to leave. How else can you talk about the word? How about huh, how you act? How about what you do? Before I go any further, I'm going to read this little story that I have here. It says, one Sunday, a man sat through his church service, and then on the way home, he fussed about the sermon. He, gripped, he, he griped about the traffic, and he complained about the heat. And he made a big fuss about how late the lunch meal was and served. Then... He bowed his head and prayed, giving God thanks for the food. Amen, right? Who hasn't done that? His son was watching him all through, all the way through this post-church experience. Just as they were getting, beginning to pass the food, he said, Daddy, did God hear you when you left the church and started fussing about the sermon and the traffic and the, about the heat? And the father blushed and said, Yes, son, he heard me. Well, Daddy, did God hear you when you just prayed for this food right now? Yes, yes, son, he heard me. Well, Daddy, which one did God believe? We teach, and we teach our children, and we're all guilty. We're all guilty of do as I say, not as I do. But God, in God's presence, he knows it all. So he's telling us, remember when I brought you out of Egypt. Remember when I brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Remember when you were in sin and I shed my blood for you on that cross. Remember the life that you had and the things that you did and the things that you don't do anymore. You're free from, you're not addicted to, you're not bound to. Remember, remember. This is a conversation you can have with your children. You can be a witness, either from your experiences, by your, be by your behavior, and by sharing the word with them. And God says to do it. So teach your children, be an example. All through chapter 6, God is instructing the people of Israel to remember his instruction, to remember he brought them out of bondage, and to teach their children lest they return to bondage themselves. It's another warning. Sinful ways 
if they, they don't want to return to their sinful ways, separated from God, out of his favor and protection. I know this is the Old Testament, and I thank God for it. God's ways are right and true. He doesn't change. Linda and I just came back from a conference this past week. It was called a time of refreshing for, for ministers, really, and their wives. But it wasn't a time of high-fiving and back-slapping and, you know, congratulating each other. It was a time of refreshing, but it was a time of correction in some sense, some, some form. In other words, this church with our pastor is blessed. And we have been coming here on Sunday, uh, Monday nights to pray and press in with God. And as I've been speaking about in his presence and letting him search your heart, that was the desire of this church family. We know we can't be the one complaining on this side and then thanking God for the meal on the other side. We can't be that person anymore. We can't be that hypocrite anymore. We can't fool God. He sees us. What we need to do, we need revival in this city. We need to come and get in his presence. So the conference, there was a lot of, uh, it was wonderful. And God is very orderly and he is the Holy Spirit, you know, whether you're in Connecticut and you're a pastor from Pakistan or whether you're a pastor from down the street or whether you're a pastor from Connecticut or a pastor from Pennsylvania or a pastor from New Bedford, God speaks to each and every one of them. And when each one of them spoke, there's, there's, there's like a progression, but yet it all went together. It's, it's very exciting to be in God's, in God's house. Well, I'll just touch a little bit on that. Pastor Elvis from India and Pakistan. Don't you love it? Pastor Elvis. He said, God, why did you, Mom, Mom why did you give me this name or something like that? He was a wonderful man of God. And he shared a little bit. And um, his message had to do in First Thessalonians, uh, First Thessalonians chapter five. I just wanted to touch on that because it it all reinforces what God has been speaking to this church already. How revival starts in us, and this this church needs to get a hold of God. And Pastor Elvis and another pastor that spoke later on. They have. They are survivors of persecution. They are survivors of violence against them and their families. They, and they looked at us, basically, and they're saying to us, wake up, America. Wake up, American church. Brothers and sisters, wake up. So I know time is short, but he spoke. Um, let me see if I can... He spoke about the importance of the Holy Spirit, Pastor Elvis did. Let's see, 1 Thessalonians. You know, I really should mark my pages when I'm going to preach. How about that next time, okay? I never thought of that before. You want to put up 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23? I'll take advantage of you so we can finish tonight. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was actually Pastor Marty. Um, but Pastor Marty made the point of, at the fall, God, God made it spirit, soul, and body. But at the fall, 
things got messed up and we were became soulish and and put ourselves our flesh first over over the spirit and pastor marty was the one who said reminded us that we are filled with the holy spirit and when we were filled with the holy spirit priorities went back into correct alignment he was showing us that it is spirit soul and body so i just wanted to share that with you cuz that was something that's we need to remember not to feed the flesh but to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh so i appreciated that and i wanted to share that with you see now you came to connecticut we had um pastor hickey who was uh you've all met pastor hickey before and um pastor hickey being pastor hickey said okay everyone turn to acts chapter 29 please Tell me when you get there Rebecca cuz you can read. Okay. You get there Reloj? You get there? Pastor Hickey, you can thank him for that. Remember, we're chapter 29. It's not written down. We are the church. We are the witnesses. Right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you God, cuz we all, you know, kind of did that double take too. So you're not alone, Rebecca. But in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost filled fell and um i'm going to i'm going to bring it home i promise in acts chapter 2 i have to have my bible i know it's up there i'm just that's the way i am sorry um okay in acts chapter 2 you said that already let me try that again how about acts chapter 1 verse 8 But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in New Bedford unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Remember in the Old Testament we read how Moses instructed the people to get the word in their heart to teach their children to be witnesses to their children. God's message doesn't change, does it? He wanted the people to get the mess. Remember he brought from them out of their sin to Egypt, out of Egypt. He wanted the people to remember to pass that message on to their children, and he wanted them to remember so that they would not be returned to that where they came from. And he wanted them to remember because the people that they encounter if if we remember where God brought us from and we encounter people we will be God's witness to those people whether they receive him or not they will not be able to argue if your life is a witness okay so here we are acts chapter 29 filled with the holy ghost we shall be witnesses we are witnesses okay and to be witnesses first we need to be in his presence first we need to come and bear our hearts to god and i know we've been coming on mondays and you say you know we're coming and we're waiting on him but he's waiting on us something in the spirit is waiting to break whether it's bob lewis who's going to come and and break open the the floodgates or rebecca or grandma or lisha or it doesn't matter god is waiting for someone to really come to his altar to his mountain so to speak to his altar and and let go and as god does a work like linda she started and as she came and she show she she witnessed she told what god had done for her 
She wasn't ashamed because she had been wrong about something. She wasn't ashamed because God corrected her. She wasn't afraid of God. She came. And revival in this city is going to start when the witnesses are right with God and their light is shining even before they open their mouth. Remember that word that said, open your mouth and I'll fill it? Yeah, I still remember that. Um, finally, um, Pastor Hickey, he also shared on, um, in the book of Acts about Paul's journey to Rome, Rome and um, the shipwreck that happened. And I never saw this until he shared it. Um, but during that ship storm that that ship was in, he said, first of all, if you're anointed, it doesn't mean you're, you're barred from any storms in your life, which we've heard that many times. Our pastors, our, we have a good pastor. <laughs> But when the storm was raging and the ship was tossing and Paul and everyone on board was starting to get, you know, let's face it, it's scary, right? You think this is the end. And they, they even threw things off the ship and they were at wit's end. They were probably about to jump off themselves rather than crash on the rocks with the, with the ship. But God sent an angel to speak with Paul. And he said, you're going to Rome. And God had a plan for his life, and God was going to see it through. But if Paul kept that to himself, that was an experience. That was a promise that God just told him. But if Paul kept that to himself, the ship still might have crashed. It did. But people might have been lost, lost their lives. There was a, the whole storm and all the people, it all came to a climax. And they were going to jump in the lifeboats, I guess, and try to make it. But Paul stopped them, and he said, he told them, my God visited me. And my God said not to, not to get, you know, leave the ship, stay in the ship. And, you know, it had to take a little bit of belief for those people not to say, yeah, okay, you stay in the ship, we're out of here, right? I mean, he's our prisoner. Are we going to listen to him? But really, you know, who is he? He's just the guy on a bus, or he's just, you know, who is he to tell me, you know? Paul opened his mouth. If he hadn't witnessed the goodness of his God and the promise that God gave him and them, they would all have been lost, or some of them at least. But, God, but Paul shared what, what God had told him. Paul said, the angel appeared to Paul, reminding him God had a purpose to fulfill, and Paul uh, will get to Rome. He will make it. So Paul had to make a choice. He chose to testify. When the ship ra raged, when the storm raged and all seemed hopeless, when the ship and the crew were about to leave the ship, Paul testified of, God, of his God and the God he served. He told them to remain in the ship and they would be saved. The men chose to follow his instruction. In verse 32, they were casting the lifeboats away. They had emptied the ship of everything that they could, trying to save themselves before that. And they threw off the lifeboats, and they trusted Paul's God. He was a witness that day. Now, I never saw that in that light before, but it's true. If your light is shining and you are, your faith is true, and you are a witness with your life, when you say something, people will believe you. They will, you know? I um, read something the other day that said, clean, clean hands or clean heart. No. <laughs> you know, clean hands are the outside. Do we want to just have clean hands? Or do we want to have a clean heart? Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? God wants it all. He doesn't want the 
the flesh, the superficial, the preparing yourself for three days and then knowing you can't go before a holy God because you're holding back. Clean hands and a pure heart. A life that's a testimony. You're a witness. So anybody in this house or hearing my voice who believes that they cannot witness, do not tell God that you cannot witness. You're telling God you don't care about the lost because God called us to be witnesses. He filled us with the Holy Ghost and power. But back in Acts 1, 8, it doesn't just say he gave us the Holy Ghost. It says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. They both go together. The power will help you to witness the Holy Ghost power, the Holy Ghost presence. So no more excuses, church. You can witness. You have a testimony. You need to open your mouth and allow God to use you. We must be honest with God in personal relationship to be truly free and to be able to live the life of freedom, life, and witness to fulfill God's plan for us. My husband told you, again, about a brother from Egypt that we met when we were gone, when we were in Connecticut. This brother, I wouldn't want to suffer one day of the things that he suffered. And I'm going to bring in some books that he read. I happen to bring the books home, so I'm going to read them. They're very small, easy reads. And I'm going to share them with the church, the you know, pastor, and then we'll put them out for people to read. We need to know what our family is going through. These are our family. He spoke of being raised a Muslim, taught to hate. He was taught to hate Jews, their pigs, and their dogs. And, and Christians are infidels. And if one of his friends, there was 13 friends, boys, and there were 13 of them, one of them found a little New Testament in the street. And apparently he secretly took it home and read it. He read the New Testament over and over and over, and he believed on Jesus Christ. And when he told his friends, one of them was this guy. He wasn't the one who found it. He was the one, one of the friends. They looked at their friend. These are boys. And they said, we have to kill you. Somebody in the group said, no, let's wait. Maybe we can, you know, win him back, so to speak. Maybe he'll change his mind. They, they had mercy, which they didn't know they were having mercy, but they didn't want to kill their friend, even though that's what their instinct and training had taught them. Well, apparently all 13 were saved, okay? But only three are alive. There's a cost. There's a cost. And we don't even have a clue. So we need to get off our chairs and worship God. We need to come into his presence and open our hearts. God doesn't want to crush you. He wants to clean you so your witness and your light will shine forth. This man is the man who cried out to us before he walked out the door, and he cried out to us, and he said, please. He said, American church, wake up. Our brothers and sisters who are suffering for Christ need the American church to be alive. We need to be witnesses, and we need to be prayer warriors. There's a battle to be won, and unless we get honest with God and get in his presence, we cannot be used. How many of us have stood up before God and said, God, use me. I want to do something for you. I'm willing. I'm here. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do, God? God, I can't talk to that person. They're going to think I'm weird. He didn't ask you to give your life at that moment. 
He didn't ask you, you know, to, to be hurt. He just asked you to open your mouth and care about that homeless or that mother or that teenager or that drug addict. He just asked you, or that man going home from work. He just asked you to open your mouth, to let your light shine. I'm getting excited. Sorry. Everyone has a testimony. In our homes, for our children, we need to speak the word, we need to live the life, as well as in our workplaces, as well as in our church, as well as in our private time. God sees you. So, only you, only you have your own testimony. Nobody else has that same testimony. And what you have lived is going to touch somebody else. God doesn't give, you know, bring, you, bring you out for a reason, you know, for no reason. So tonight I pray, brothers and sisters, I pray, can I get a witness? That'll be our, can I get a witness? Are you a witness for Jesus Christ tonight? Are you going to let your light shine? Do you want to be in God's presence? Do you want him to search you and cleanse you and mold you and shape you like you sing? Don't just sing the songs. Live it. Amen.